Hey, I'm Jay Kumar, the Bass Blaster, and this is your Seafoam Top 5 of the Week in Bass Fishing, number one. The undefeated heavyweight champion of the world. Well, it turns out Patrick Walters is the 20 fish smallmouth champion of the Bassmaster Elite World. His 105 pounds of smallmouth bass is a new Bassmaster Elite Series record and was good enough to get him his second blue trophy at the St. Lawrence River. I mean, it was his second blue trophy and this one was at the St. Lawrence River. The first one wasn't. He beat the Canadian Johnston brothers. They're always killers up there. Three of the four Japanese guys on the elites and a host of other sticks, including Angler of the Year, Kyle Welcher, who we'll get to in a minute. Now, Patrick played it safe on the windy day one by fishing the mouth of the river, but he found some good fish there. And on days two and three, when it calmed down, and also day four, he went out to the lake and he just crushed them. He drop shot it the whole time, he said, because of its efficiency. And Bass said the baits he fished were a Mega Bass Hazadong or Hazadong Shad, I'm not really sure how to pronounce that and a Berkeley Maxent flat nose minnow, though Patrick told me he used a variety of baits and colors. Key to his fish landing success, which is huge in smallmouth tournaments, were the new VMC Redline Ultra High End Hooks, which he said stick them and they don't flex. Not that kind of flex. Anyhow, you probably figured forward-facing sonar was key for him, and it was, and in his case, it was Garmin Live Scope. He caught 19 of the 20 bass he weighed that way. He also stuck with the drab-colored shorts and the bushy stash because they work for him, man. Number two. Let those who exist long after us know that this was our finest hour. Was Kyle Welcher watching Transformers the last night before the day he launched at the Bassmaster Elite on the St. Lawrence River? Maybe, because in a way it was his finest hour, and it was a battle. He battled and overcame eight footers on Lake Ontario to get out to his spot, and it was on when he got there, and it, that made it hard for Brandon Cobb, who was one point behind him in the Angler of the Year standings, to hang with him in this tournament. Here's what Kyle said about it. He had a very slim lead coming into this. I really came into this tournament thinking that AI, AOI still had to be won. And I wasn't gonna do anything to lay up. I was gonna take the big risk. And if it, I would rather lose taking a big risk and trying to win than you know to play it safe and lose. I'd never get over it, so. And so he ended the season with his best finish of the year at fifth in this tournament and the amazing Angler of the Year title, Bassmaster Angler of the Year, one of the hardest things to win in bass fishing. By the way, thanks to that day one risk, he ended up winning it by almost 30 points, and Brandon Cobb had a decent tournament. Big congrats to Kyle, man, and by the way, he asked Greg Hackney if Godzilla had anything on him now, and then he asked KVD if he was now part of the community, but they haven't gotten back to him yet, man. Number three. How did the country that gave us giant stuff like Godzilla, sumo wrestling, and the world record largemouth produce some of the best finesse fishermen fishing little tiny baits that we've ever seen? Well, it sounds like it's the tough bass fishing over there that did it, but all that really matters is that the Japanese guys who come over here now are some of the best finesse fishermen, like I said, we've ever seen. And that, of course, means they're really good smallmouth fishermen. Now, three of the four Japanese guys fishing on the Elite Series were in the top 10 at the St. Lawrence, and one of them, uh, Taku Ito, won at the St. Lawrence Elite two years ago. Another one of them, Kiyoya Fujita, just won the week before at the Lake Champlain Elite. Now after that tournament, Kiyoya got internet famous for all the transducers he was using in, his, in that tournament or on his boat. But here's Zona with a great explanation of why he won. It's not a secret spot. There has been tournaments dominated in that area for years. 
but he basically just outfished anglers around him really from 25 all the way out to 50 60 feet of water so yeah he outfished everyone at basically a community hole not because he's just a whiz bang ace with forward facing sonar but because he's an excellent finesse fisherman also a confident one as are taku ito and kenta kimura I mean, look at these little strange baits they fish. Who fishes bugs in 20 to 50 feet of water, sometimes weightless? Well, these guys do, and they do great with them. They know stuff that we don't know about finesse fishing. But anyhow, other than that, I heard from some guys at the campground that they also power up like the Dragon Ball Z guys. Number four. What are the best jig colors? Well, that's an easy one. Green pumpkin and black and blue. I think we all know that one, that's easy. But that sure isn't all the colors that there is and I guarantee you, you got more colors than that in your jig box. So I was talking to Gail Julian the other day. He is the owner of Jewel Jigs and a certified jig genius. And I asked him, what other colors do we need to have other than those two? Well, the first one he mentioned was Bass Whacker, which is a color that he developed to mimic a crawfish and a bluegill. And it's one that he had for five years and didn't release because he was catching more and bigger fish with it. And he was catching fish behind people with it. Did I mention he's a tournament fisherman too? Now, the other color he mentioned was PB&J, also known as Brown and Purple. Now, I bet you didn't know that's also a color that Gail invented many years ago. His jig skirt supplier actually came up with a name for it after Gail specified the color. The guy said it reminded him of a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. There you go. Now, one reason Gail likes it, he says he's a big believer in contrasting skirt colors like black and blue, green pumpkin and orange, and in this case, brown and purple. And that's why, by the way, Gail says he almost never uses the same color trailer with his jig because he likes the contrast between the two. Now, Gail has fished and invented more great jigs than maybe anybody ever, man, so don't doubt him. Whack some bass like this with some Bass Whacker or PB&J. Number five. Do we all need the leash? If you never heard of it, it's a $300 device that's made to keep your outboard from flipping up into the boat if you happen to hit a log, stump, or other underwater obstruction when you're running at speed. Think it can't happen? Well, it does every year. I'm not going to share those painful stories here, but a quick Google search will show you. Also, NPFL and Toyota Series angler Doug Chapin had it happen to him this year. And luckily, neither the weight of the motor nor the spinning prop got him. Anyhow, the leash sold by Precision Sonar was invented to stop this, or hopefully stop this exact thing from happening. 95% of the accidents that's out there, you hit something under the water, whether that be a rock or a stump or whatever, it throws the outboard motor up into the boat. We're going into the fall time of year, the fall drawdown. A lot of lakes across the country are going to be seeing those lower lake levels. And this is one of those products. It's a, it's a one-time insurance policy is the way I see it. It's a seat belt for your outboard motor. It's one of those products that I believe should come standard on every single bass boat out there. I happen to agree, and I hope they do become standard on bass boats. I'm buying one, man. That's all I got for you this week. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Seafoam. Go to BassBlaster.com or .rocks for all the juice and all the emails. See you next week. God bless you.